Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 2019 science fiction horror film, Color Out of Space. Now, before I get around to sharing more of my thoughts on this film, I want to give a special shout out to Miguel for requesting this review. And if there's another review of a film or a TV show, or if there's a topic you would like to see me discuss in the future... Uh, feel free to donate to my PayPal. The link will be in the video description down below. And I'll try to get to it as soon as I possibly can. Now, Color Out of Space is one of those films that when it was announced and when the trailer dropped, I was definitely curious about it. I mean, that's why I, I purchased it on 4K. Uh, because I like Nicolas Cage and... This is another horror film uh, featuring Nicolas Cage, and I was a huge fan of Mandy. Uh, I still am. I think Mandy is a is a fantastic film. Um, and I already liked the short story or the story this is based on uh, by H.P. Lovecraft, and I liked the uh, '80s adaptation of it, The Curse with Will Wheaton. So I uh, this was one that I definitely. Uh, wanted to check out and after finally watching it I gotta be honest I was a little disappointed by this film I'm not gonna sit here and say that it's terrible I'm not gonna say it's a, it's a bad film but I would say that this is in my opinion Richard Stanley's weakest film I much prefer Hardware and I even prefer Dust Devil over this even with that film's issues and honestly, I think the 80s version uh, w with Will Wheaton is, is more entertaining and is a more satisfying uh, uh, usage of this source material. Despite the fact that this, this version is probably a little bit more accurate. But that's the problem with, with Lovecraft. Lovecraft is one of those writers that is almost impossible to adapt properly with the film because the way that he writes and a lot of the things that he creates with his pen are really difficult to pull off uh in in cinema and he isn't the best when it comes to writing characters he doesn't really explain a lot of things that are going on he leaves a lot to your imagination which in the realm of a book or a story you can get away with a little bit more of that, but in a screenplay, you can't. So it just makes things feel like there really isn't really a whole lot of soul or spirit or care for a lot of things that are happening. There was a lot of care, though, put into the direction of the film by Richard Stanley. Stanley hadn't directed anything since Dust Devil. And he came back and did this film, and I don't think it's nearly as good visually or when it comes to uh, the usage of uh, techniques as his previous efforts. But it's still it's still a film that you can tell there's somebody behind it that knows what they're doing, that knows how to really create some startling or striking imagery. And, uh, I, I think that when it comes to the images in the film, like the, the more horrific body horror elements of the movie, or just, uh, the, the more depraved out there stuff, I definitely do feel that is where the direction shines the most, but I didn't really see as much movement or much creativity with the camera angles, uh, as, uh, I saw in Dust Devil or even in Hardware, so, the direction is fine, but comparison to his other films, I don't think it's as good. I don't think it helps either that there's a lot of stuff going on with the film when it comes to filters uh, in post-production and CGI, and uh, I don't think Richard Stanley is really the best guy to, to be working with a lot of CGI. It seems like the best work he's put out is stuff that he's forced to work around his limitations and th this just at times 
kind of reminded me of something you might see uh, on the CW or the sci-fi channel, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so there were some shots that were kind of flat, uh, a lot more than I personally saw in, in, in his previous films. Also, I don't think he worked really the best with his entire cast. Nicholas Cage in particular, I don't think he delivered a very good performance. It was entertaining, but I don't think it was intentionally uh, supposed to be funny. I think it was just another instance of a director who didn't how didn't know how to rein Cage in and let him loose a little bit too much to the detriment of the film. Like I couldn't take a lot of the scenes seriously with Nick Cage because he's just so over the top. And that really hurt the tone of the film. It really hurt the horror. It really hurt a lot of the things it was trying to do with the body horror and just the the existential dread and all this other stuff. And it, it just really didn't help. And I think if you kind of scaled things back a little bit, maybe it wouldn't necessarily be as entertaining in a so bad it's good way with some of those scenes in the cage. But I think the film would have would have been beneficial I, I think that would have been something that benefited the movie in the long run because it would have helped it have a more consistent tone because you don't have a lot of that stuff in Lovecraft uh, like you don't have a lot of that kind of performance or anything like that in in you know an HP Lovecraft story but then again having over the top stuff works in other Lovecraft a adaptations like reanimator so maybe that's what Stanley was trying to go for here. But I just think Reanimator, for instance, had a much more consistent tone. And speaking of tone, really, a lot of the film's issues come down to the script by Richard Stanley and Scarlett Amaris. And once again, I don't think Stanley's as good of a writer as he is a director. I think he should have hired somebody else. I don't think Scarlett Amaris is that great either. I think you should have hired somebody who was already pretty well renowned or at least knew what they were uh, talking about when it comes to Lovecraft. Um, because there are times where this just feels like some other movie that somebody came up with and wrote that had nothing to do with H.P. Lovecraft and they just threw in some Lovecraft uh angles into it because there's a lot of stuff that definitely wasn't in color out of space like you don't have the toxic ecologist or really it's the water the the water guy the hydrologist you don't have the hydrologist you don't have the stuff with the guy who lives on the property who's uh who's living off the grid you don't have any of that and I get it. You need to try to update things to modern audiences. And in all honesty, that's really the least of the script's problems. A lot of it just comes down to the tone. It really does. It comes down to certain scenes that just come across as laughably over the top. Uh, and it's not just because of the, the way that the actors portray these scenes. It's also the dialogue. There's other moments where the suspense or the tension is completely reduced to almost nothing because you have lines of dialogue that give away what's going to happen next like there's a whole line about oh i don't think you're going to recognize g-spot if you see her again uh which is the the off the grid guy who's played by tommy chong and he's talking about his cat his cat's named g-spot and he's talking to two of the characters and he says, oh, you're not going to recognize her if you see her again. And then there's a scene later on where, of course, the, the cat is all deformed. Don't give that away. What are you doing? That's not that's not if, if, if you're trying to build tension and suspense, you don't have a line of dialogue that undermines that suspense. And there's a, there's a few there's a few other sequences that do that with the dialogue. I don't think it really did the best job in terms of making you sympathize or care about this family either or the romance between uh, uh, the, the the lead girl, uh, Lavinia, and the hydrologist, uh, uh, Ward. 
And that just made the film just kind of drag. And it doesn't help either. Like for the first 40 minutes, there's not really a lot that's happening other than attempts at character depth that kind of make you sympathize with Lavinia for a little bit because of how she feels within her family and how, and, and what's going on with her dealing with what happened to her mother and she feels like an outcast. So correction. Um, I know I said uh, that Lavinia was dealing with a lot of uh, issues that stem from her mother's death. Her mother is still alive. Her mother is just uh, recuperating and dealing with the aftermath of cancer. And so that is what Lavinia is struggling with is the fact that her mother had to have a mastectomy and she survived the cancer, but she lost a, a part of herself. So there is a growing a bit of um, not necessarily strife, but, but there's definitely a lot of tension and a lot of uh, drama that's, that's uh, coming out of uh, the relationship between Lavinia and her mother. And, and that's affecting her. And I, I just wanted to point that out because I didn't want, you know, people to think that I got things confused and there's a stepmom and whatever. And, and if I, when I, when I say stepmom or stepmother for the rest of the video, uh, keep in mind, uh, I am aware of the fact that it's actually her real mother. I just don't want to have to like do any like extra editing. So I just wanted to add a little bit of a correction here. And uh, now we'll get back to the rest of the video. But all the other members of the family, there's really not much there in terms of sim uh, sympathy uh, or care. And they try to do that too with the, the, the stepmom, but like, I don't really give a shit about her. I don't care about her meetings on Zoom. It doesn't matter to me. Or the whole stuff with Nick Cage's character and and uh, Nathan and how he's oh I'm just like my father I I'm I moved to onto his farm you know did everything that I said I wasn't gonna do you know I don't I don't really care about that either and here's the thing like yeah the meteor does hit the farm within like the first thirty minutes or so. But it hits the farm, and other than, like, one, like, pink bug that you see that comes out of a well, and people seeing CGI colors, that's really about it for the first 40 to 45 minutes of, of the script. And I think they could have had a little bit more going on, a little bit more horror elements or something in there. I know they're trying to do a slow burn, but it just got to the point where I got bored with it. I got to be honest. I really did. I wasn't as invested in the hydrologist angle. Um, and I get that you're trying to have some sort of mystery and that's understandable, but it just got to the point where it's kind of tedious and I didn't really care. It felt like the screenwriters put more emphasis into alpaca dialogue than really anything else for the first 40, 45 minutes. The film gets more intriguing once it's it really starts to get crazier with uh, the color infecting more and more people. The whole bit with uh, the son and the mother melding together like something straight out of a David Cronenberg movie. And various other just craziness. But a lot of it's just, it, it's just never explained. You don't know what the goal of the color is. You don't know why the color is here. And I understand that's Lovecraft for you. But like I said, that's something that doesn't necessarily translate as well on the screen. And there were attempts to try to have some really intense emotion. Like with the kid and the mom who were turned into this monster. This this creature. The whole scene where Nathan uh, is flipping out and... And is eating the tomatoes and they don't taste right. And just him gradually losing his mind. But I didn't feel the gradual loss of his sanity. 
really had as much impact as it could have because Nick Cage wasn't reined in. There were moments where I don't even think the color even had hit the farm yet and he's already acting wonky. So that didn't really help. And there's this whole extended scene which just felt like padding where it was just like, oh, I'm going to shoot uh, the 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 monster that my wife and my kid had become. Oh wait, no, I'm not going to do that. So we could just just have this scene where the monster is trying to eat uh her daughter because uh, uh Nathan is has slipped out of reality. So he's just the sanity is has slipped so much that he's trying to feed his daughter to this thing that used to be his wife and his kid his son and it's just there for that that supposedly tense scene but i thought it was honestly kind of a predictable moment and on top of that it did it just felt like padding they stretched it out to the point where okay all right this is where we're going with this and then it ends predictably where nathan just shoots the thing anyway so it's like okay well you just stretched it out for a kind of not really the, the the best reason and you get to the ending and the ending is a mess of just bad cgi and just nonsensical stuff like if you grew to care about lavinia or you actually like nathan well nathan dies lavinia dies the only survivor at the end of this story is a hydrologist and his his survival makes no sense. He's inside the house when this like all this light and these colors are just enveloping it, and it seems like it's just collapsing in on itself and transporting to some other plane of his ex- existence. And somehow he survives that, and he crawls out under the wreckage of the house, and there's this like massive a crater that's left behind that's just full of ash like it's the end of the movie predator and the guy just is just fine i'm like how like what how did the color not affect him it affected everyone else it affected lavinia pretty quickly you know it took out ezra uh, it, it affected everyone else in the family, Benny and Jack. I want to speak to Jack. That was that. Uh, ben, actually, it's Benny, the the teenage son, Benny. That that character felt pretty extraneous, and it didn't help either that the way that he died was beyond dumb. He thinks he hears the uh, the family dog down in a well. And this is af- after the point when he's already seen all this crazy shit and Lavinia is already trying to tell him that don't trust anything you see and all of that. And he still goes down into the well like a dumbass, and then gets enveloped by the color and is essentially killed. And I'm like, well, that was dumb. So that's another thing about the script I don't care for. There's a lot of dumb moments in it where you're like, why the hell did he go down to the well? I know they're trying to explain, oh, well, because he was manipulated mentally by the color and blah de blah blah but I'm sorry, it just seems like a, a lazy bit of writing in order to uh, take the guy out. That's what it seems like to me. And it wasn't even a satisfying death either. He gets enveloped in CGI pink and purple. And that's another thing. I Maybe that was in the story. I don't necessarily remember what the color out of space was from the source material. But, you know, it looks pretty cool, you know, on, on a cover on cover art. But like when you see it in the film, it's kind of it's not scary. It's like pink and purple. It, it just it, it makes me think of like Victoria's Secret or some shit. Like it just doesn't really provide a, that much creep factor for me or dread it doesn't help either that all, all pretty much almost every scene involving the color is bathed in some pretty cheap looking CGI. But the film does have its moments when it comes to the script. I'll give it that. 
the stuff with the mom and the and the son melding together that was pretty messed up uh the bit with the alpacas when they merge into one monster which reminded me of the thing uh by john carpenter and nathan goes in and shoots them with a shotgun and there's a few other moments where you're like okay that's that's creepy that's interesting but it just doesn't really gel for me it doesn't really come together to a satisfying whole uh, uh for me personally and it's just really due to the script i just didn't get as invested into the plot or a lot of the characters other than maybe lavinia and at times nathan and then both of them you know either go crazy or die so I guess if you like the hydrologist guy uh, a bit uh, or a lot and you get into that subplot, then I think the film might have better pacing and you'll get more out of it. But if you're just indifferent on that character, then it's it's not really going to be as satisfying of a film. And I'm almost like, did so I guess he survived... Because, because he's a, a person of color. Is that really what it is? I'm just, I'm just trying to make sense of it. So Ward survived because he's black. Is that basically what the, what the, what the film is trying to say? I don't know. I really don't know. Cause, um, it does kind of seem like there are some, political leaning some stuff under the surface in terms of subtext with this script but it's not very subtle and it's kind of clunky in terms of the way that it's put in there like the last uh, uh scene for instance with uh ward talking about environmental damage and all of this other stuff but yeah the script i'm not going to say it outright sucks but I think it's I, I think it's below average. I really don't think the screenplay is nearly as clever or nearly as well thought out as other people do. But that's just me personally. Now we get to the cast where, I mean, you got to start with Nicolas Cage, who at times he's like the best part of this movie, but also the worst part of this movie. So, yeah, Nick Cage... He's entertaining in this during these freak out scenes, but it's not what I would call good acting. So he's upset at his daughter, Lavinia, and he's all like, nothing is fucking this place up. You know, I've had it with your drama, Lavinia. So why don't you do me a favor and get the fuck out of my sight? Okay. Oh, no, 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 wait, wait. I'll get the fuck out of yours. <laughs> it's just like... Nick, what is going on, man? And that's nothing compared to, like, the freakout of all freakouts when his car doesn't start, and he's just like, fucking cocksucker. Cocksucker! Fucking cocksucker! Cocksucker! <laughs> it's just like, what the hell? Dude. It's like Stanley just did not know how to rein Nick in. And as a result, like it just leads to just total ludicrousness. And I understand that it's trying to show insanity. He's losing his mind and all of that. But it just doesn't come across as authentic. It feels forced. And it makes his descent into madness just a descent into hilarity. And I don't really think that that's necessarily the right vibe that a film that has such extreme body horror and some legitimately just unsettling and just creepy moments. I don't think that's really the best thing to, to throw in there. It's it's I do. I feel that for all of its positives, for all of the laughs that I get out of it. The end result is not so amazing and spectacular in the scope of the film that I really feel that it was even necessary. 
So this isn't a movie that needed Cage coming in and just stealing the scene and stealing the scenery and chewing it up and spitting it out and just doing his whole shtick. Uh, I, I, I think it really would have benefited more from having Cage reined in. Uh, but... That's just me. I know a lot of people disagree when it comes to to this film. Um, Jolie Richardson plays uh, the mother. Um, And she's... She's fine. Uh, I'm not going to say... Say that she's... uh, Terrible by any means. Um, I, I think... She definitely, out of the two, uh, with you know, when you have Nick Cage and her, I think she delivered the more consistent performance, and I think she deserves a lot of credit for what she did under all that makeup. Um, when it comes to like the body horror scenes, but I didn't necessarily necessarily connect with the character as much, but I don't blame Julie Richardson for that. Madeline Arthur, I would say, was the biggest uh, standout performer for me. Lavinia, uh, I liked her character. Uh, that's a, that's actually why I thought it was a bummer that she makes it all the way through the majority of the movie until the film just all of a sudden decides to kill her off. Uh, Brendan Mayer, nah, not wasn't really big on that performance. The, the The performance seemed like something you'd see on the Disney Channel. It really did. Uh, uh, same thing for Julian Hilliard as the youngest son, uh, Jack. Uh, Elliot Knight is Ward, the hydrologist. He's there for me. This kind of run of the mill. Uh, Tommy Chong, it was fun to see him, but a lot of the scenes with him, just I didn't know if I was supposed to take them seriously or not. And that was another reason why the tone of the film was affected, was the stuff with Tommy Chong. Uh, the sheriff guy barely had anything in it, so I don't know what to say. Uh, Karyanka Kilcher is the mayor, played a good bitch, but she was barely in the movie. So really, yeah, the majority of, of, of the running time really is dedicated mostly to Nick Cage and Elliot Knight and, uh, Madeline Arthur. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's an all right cast. Feel the same way about the cinematography by Steve Annis. Uh, there are times where it's absolutely breathtaking when it's showcasing the setting of the farm or really focusing on the, the inherent beauty of a landscape or the nightmarish qualities of, of a certain uh, area of the house or of, of uh, the grounds. But there's other moments where it just looks kind of cheap, to be perfectly honest. The editing by Brett W. Bachman at times is tense and and can be pretty disorientating, crazy, and really does provide the right mood and atmosphere, or at least helps do that. But then there's other moments where it's just a little bit just lackluster. The score by Colin Stetson, I thought it was pretty... Um, I wouldn't say lame, but it was just pretty meh. Pretty mad, mediocre sc- score that I don't really remember much of anything from. And, you know, this is the same guy who's worked on a lot of... Yeah, he did the score for The Menu, I think. Yeah, he did the score for The Menu, which came out in 2022. He also did Hereditary. Oh, he did this sh- fucking score for Hereditary, which is just nothing but droning music. No wonder this score w- didn't do much for me. Because it was mostly just atmospheric music, again. Nothing memorable about it. And, yeah, it's 111 minutes, but it does drag at times. A little too much for me, because I'm not interested in the hydrologist subplot as much as uh, I, the, the writers think I will be. And it does. It takes a little bit too long to really kick into gear and really go into the craziness and the body horror and all of that. And I guess... It, And also the body horror stuff, because of the inconsistent tone of the movie, it's not as horrifying as it could be. And it just doesn't really carry the same weight or the same resonance. So it's just one of those films where at the end of the day, like I wasn't a fan of it. I thought it was 
below average. Uh, I appreciate the creativity. I appreciate the fact that Richard Stanley and everyone involved tried to do something unique and out there and somewhat innovative, but I just didn't really feel that it, it, it clicked. It didn't gel together for me. Um, but anyway, that's my uh, thoughts on color out of space. And until next time, I'll see you later.